Okay, welcome to the last talk before lunch. We are now in a talk on malware attribution by Michael Bowman, and I'm looking forward to the talk. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about malware attribution, the theory, the code, and result of my research. A year ago, I was standing here and talk about my strange hobby, which was malware analysis. And uh, I'm here now talking about most of the results of that hobby. I've been playing around for uh, a while, about almost 10 years I calculated yesterday, with malware collection and analysis. And uh, I have uh, changed jobs since I was here last year. I'm actually now working for an anti-malware company, which is not any way associated with my research here. It's a pure hobby, it's done in my spare time, using servers mounted on IKEA furniture under my staircase. So it's, uh, my, I'm here as an independent researcher. So the agenda for today is the theory behind the malware attribution. We can talk about like, how I'm doing it with code and some of the results I've uh, gathered so far. So malware attribution is to find, uh, put a face behind the author of the malicious code. Greg Hudland presented at Black Hat 2010 about how he did it. And I was like, damn, that's cool. I want to do it too. The thing is, he was talking about that his code was going to be released on like 100 CDs, go to his boat. Uh, the code was nowhere to be found, so I started from scratch. But let's back up a little bit. What are we trying to do? We want to move from binary to the more of the human side. We won't be able to get to the human which means a uh, face and name and uh, address, the physical address. But we want to go from just checksums as well. So it's totally, on the left side you have the, the totally useless stuff, like uh, MD5 checksums. They change every time you compile a code, you pack it. <coughs> yeah, totally useless data. What's starting to be interesting is the um, Next step, the net recon, the command and control. That part is very nice to analyze, especially the command and control bits, because those seldom change. Because you have to think about it, if you change the command and control protocol, you lose your old botnet. You can no longer communicate with the old bot, so that seldom change. Then you have the developer fingerprints, and that's everything from compilers, the development environment, to how the author is actually structuring his code. How big does he make his buffers? What libraries does he like to use? What versions? Then you got to the, to the TTP, the tactics, techniques, and procedures. What is actually do, trying to do? Like, what's after? Is it stealing your credit card number? Is it stealing your Vov account? Is it stealing data? Is it just selling your machine as a spam bot? What is it trying to do? And how does it do it? Then you're getting more and more closer to the human. You're starting to find like your, your, digi in, your digital intelligence, like stalking the guy on Facebook and so on. And then you end up in physical surveillance with human intelligence, like stalking him in real life. Those last two, I'm leaving to the professional, the police, uh, and so on. That's not my hobby. So going back in more detail, so the net recon is your command and control, this is the encryption, your DNS, uh, your protocol. Very unique, oh, not very, very unique, but in context can be unique. 
You have developer fingerprints. This is the shell code they exploit. The, the defensive, the anti-forensics techniques he's using for his code, if any. And the communications. All those com combined can attribute a, a group or a single developer. Then you have your TTP, your, your intent, the installation, deployment. How does it get the code on your box? Is it a fake AV? Uh, is it an um, email attachment? How does it like to send you the data, the, the metrics code? The thing is, I have very limited time to do it. I had to start to concentrate on something. So I'm starting to concentrate on the dead code. I'm looking at the developer fingerprints. I'm right now just looking at the uh, at static binary analysis. The thing is that if I was to run this in a virtual machine, each sample takes about five minutes. I can run maybe 10 virtual machines, so I get two results a minute. It's still not a lot if you think about how fast I can do binary analysis. And I'm having a problem with disk space and hardware issues in general. So how do I do it? Well, it's a three-step process. As a, now you come from binary, so it's a four steps. First, you are gathering your malware. And sometimes you just look in your inbox, sometimes you actually go out and look for it. Uh, you go and extract your metadata from the binary. You're storing it and you're analy analyzing it. So how do you go and get some malware? Well, I'm lazy. I, just, I want to have a pre-packaged malware, pre-found. So I go into virus share, the open malware, the mail share, CleanMX, malware domain list, etc. Using a cron job that just pull the latest stuff. Um, virus share, the, releasing a torrent with about 50 gigs of new malware every once, twice a week. So it's a lot. So first step, extracting metadata from binary. But what kind of metadata do you see in binary? Well, let's go through the how you, how you do, go around when you're compiling code. First, you have your source code. You have your tweaks and mod of the original source code. You have third-party libraries and third-party source code. All that, you're making a program throw it into the compiler, which has a runtime library, and uh, the compiler is spitting out things like uh, time. In, in the P header, you have the compile time. You have some paths. Uh, sometimes you can even get the path of the document and settings, which usually is a username. Uh, MAC address, uh, the UID version one, uh, in, had your MAC address as the last digits of the GUID. So if you have if find, uh, oh, if you're looking at old binaries, you can actually find the network code of the machine that was compiling the code. This is good if you're doing a forensic investigation. You actually find a suspect. You st you take his machine, doing some analysis, and say, oh, this MAC address, yeah, that one is bound to these malware samples. It's quite a strong case. Of course, MAC address can always be faked, but more difficult. So, what data am I collecting? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm doing hashes. Uh, I'm doing uh, uh, MD5, SHA1, SHA256, 5.12. Etc. just to be able to identify the malware. So if someone says, hey, do you have this malware sample ID? And I say, mm, well, let me look. I'm also doing an SSD hash, which is a fuzzy hash. It doesn't need to be an exact match, just close enough. 
uh, also keeping track of like file type using FS, uh, using PAID. So I get to know what the compiler, the packet, the kind of executable. I'm looking at the PE headers, the imports, the exports, the linker, the version information, everything. I'm gra uh, grabbing the virus total results for a good measure. And I, I'm assigning tags to the sample as well. So when you are identifying your compiler packet, is that every time you compile a program, the compiler has some optimization, like how does it does the code? How does it transform C code to an executable? And the way Visual C++ does it is different from GCC, is different from Ming, uh, GV, G GCC, is different between all the compilers. So you can look for those fingerprints and say, oh, well, this was a Boland C++, or this was a Visual C++, or this was a GCC compiler. Yeah, this uh, PID, Windows Utility, but this doesn't, this doesn't really work for me because I'm um, into automati automation. I need to have it done, working when I'm not, or actually when I am working. Um, so the PUtils library in Python has the same thing. It's using the same database. So I'm getting it programmatically. Then I'm keeping the PE header information. I'm not quite sure what I'm looking for right now, so I'm just storing the whole header information. It may be useful, it may be not. I'm just, just keeping it. And also doing a virus total result uh, cache, but just because I want, maybe we want to look for a specific virus uh, or family or see if it was well detected or not when I found it. Uh, that data I'm not updating is just when I found it, when I added it to the database, not what happened a week later. And I have this tag system where I can assign tags to the member sample. So I can say, that, well, this one is doing anti forensics, uh, this one's using the Tor network, uh, I got this sample from virus, to, uh, virus share and so on, so I keep in track of where I got it from, uh, the, what have, have uh, my conclusions so far, and I just add tags as I do in the analysis. Next step is to store the malware. I'm using MongoDB, uh, I found it's, uh, it's um, it's suitable, I, I, I like to work with it, so it's like, uh, it's the hammer and everything, my, all my problems seems to look like snails. So uh, I'm using MongoDB for everything now. And um, the author of Cuckoo Sandbox, he had released a project called VX Cage, which is uh, a malware repository. So it's a REST API, you can just upload, download malware from it. The thing is, was using, uh, uh, standard SQL databases and file system. And I wanted something more agnostic. I don't want to have it tied to a specific server. I want to be able to easily replicate the re server. I want to be able to share. And I was reading through the uh, MongoDB specifications like, uh, you want to share data? Yeah, just, uh, just add another node and connect, connect, create a connection. And it magically happens. So like, cool. So I modified the VX cage uh, server. Um, my modification is collecting a lot of more metadata. The original just created the hashes. I'm collecting uh, my PE headers and so on. I'm storing everything in MongoDB using GridFS. I'm not storing anything on file system. The REST API is quite simple. You have a, you connect to the web server and you ask for a slash malware slash add to, to um, provide the post data to add a new sample. You do a get request to get back the sample and you can do, use any kind of hash. It uh, doesn't matter if it's just uh, more intelligent uh, selection of the sample. The original needed to have a SHA-256 
uh, hash to get a sample. I'm doing a fussy, uh, a more liberal search in the database. So I'm searching for all kind of hashes. You can get the metadata using the find uh, API. And you can search then by uh, m 5 sum, show sum, SSD, tag, date. I haven't exposed the whole MongoDB res uh, data yet, so, but in the end you should be able to query more or less directly to the MongoDB to get whatever data you want. So you say, uh, I want this PE header, that's everything that matches this PE header and value, and like, okay, I'll give you. And I also can list all the tags, so I can search by tag. Now, this comes to the real thing. Did I find anything? That's a very good question. Did I find anything? Um, yes or no? We start looking at what, what are we looking for? We're looking for compiler, we're looking for linkers, the libraries, strings, paths, p headers, compile times, number of soft times software being built. If you're uh, compiling the bug version, your compilers are actually keeping track of how many times you have been compiling this piece of code. So you can see that, oh, now you're trying for 28th time to get this code running. Also trying to catalog behaviors. Packers, it's encryption, anti-debugging, anti-VM, anti-forensics. I'm just doing static analysis here. I'm looking for specific API calls or specific code um, strings, so code sections. So for the results here, um, been limiting the, what, what the results I have, it's uh, a, a lot of data and uh, it takes a, a, a long time to do these graphs. Um, have, before I start, have you ever heard about SSD patching? Any show of hands? So um, four or five people. It's uh, SSD, uh, it's, a, it's a fuzzy hatch. It's, it's showing like close enough results. So I have a, a, an HTML page here that actually contains some malware. It has uh, two different MD5 sums, but the only thing that changed was the capture code and the number of visitors of the page. So as SSD says, this is 100% the same thing. MD5 sum, sum it's not. I'm using this SSD data to compare each sample, each other, and you get a, a score of how, how much in common they're using. And I said, okay, give me all the samples that at least 50% in common of, the, of my seed sample, and do it recursively. And I end up with a graph like this. So this is from a single sample I got. From that sample, I got uh, extracted 3,007, uh, 3,006 other samples that are sharing code uh, with each other. So you see here, as you have, uh, in the bottom you have a main contributor to a, a lot of samples. That, that one is not sharing so much code with the one on the top, can't show you uh, on the top circle. But it's sharing some code on the, on the left side with that bit of the triangle. And between the top and the bottom, there's just one. Uh, you have a, a few uh, samples of sharing code, but it's quite, there's a, a few common monitors. It's like, uh, the top, bottom, uh, the top and the bottom doesn't have share much code except this middle link. And that's good if you, if you uh, like say, you get an unknown sample. You can quickly do uh, an SSD hash and do a, a lookup of that hash and see if, if this one has patterns, code patterns that are known to belong to other malicious code that's already been categorized.
not all samples are sharing code. You have here you have a main sample that are sharing code with a lot of things, but I haven't found any uh, samples that sharing code with those and stuff further. But the thing is, uh, I'm still doing the index building, so um, I'm having a, like a big data problem. Um, just before I started this talk, I, I saw that I have 707,000 samples in my database, and it's, I keep adding it as I'm standing here. And you have like the party handshake problem. So if I want to, if to compare each sample with each other, I'm doing at 250 billion compares. And that was just growing. So I need to find a better way to pre-select what I'm comparing. I'm not trying to find all the, the, the same or similar code. I'm trying to find this was, uh, that are at least 50% similar. So you heard about a lot of packers and compilers and so on. What is most common? So I asked my database, what are the most common packers or compilers? Bull and Delphi was the top scorer. For some reason, Delphi is very common in Maverick development. We just like it. We should see plus plus version six and then eight, and then Visual Basic version five. Also common. On fifth place, you got the first packer, UPX. So you, you hear about a lot of packing, but I don't see it right now. Then again, my, my sample source are limited. I have not got up to date with the latest malware in my database. I'm still adding old stuff, but old stuff is like this year. Let's say if you want to look for an identified packers, how would you do go about that? Well, a packer, um, if you look at the PE headers, a packer uh, usually have an empty section, which is uh, writable and executable, which is when you run the code, you unpack two, but it's size zero at the dev code. That's a, that's a giveaway. I won't say it's, I find everything like that, but it's something to look for. Especially if uh, you have, have such a PE header and there's no known packer, you can start looking and see if you can find anything to fingerprint. And then once you have fingerprinted, maybe you can put a name on it. How common are the anti-debugging techniques? Uh, not so much. Uh, this data is a bit misrepresenting because I'm actually uh, blind for pack data. Uh, if you are using a packer, I don't see this is the debugger present until you unpack the code, which I'm not doing. I'm doing dead code analytics. So, but. As you see, the, top, uh, the UPX the f was the fifth most common uh, packer or compiler. Any questions so far? I'm running out of slides here. I'm I was hoping for more interaction, but uh, <laughs> yeah, good, great. Um, so back to my coverage. Um, here's the, your, your, how you decode, how your binary is being developed. You have your source code, you have your com machine, your compiler, you have your malware packing and so on. Uh, I'm currently doing the packing and identification, I'm doing the time, the compiler, the runtime libraries, the API calls. I'm not yet doing all the uh, string dumping. Um, I need to go around and implement that one. 
but my, the time to add a sample is already increasing, so I, this morning I thought about why am I trying to do everything at once? I should, I should uh, split up the problem and just go, just go back to adding checksum and have other processes go and bet, do a batch job to do add the other metadata. So I not need to wait maybe 10 seconds for every time I add a sample. So what I'm trying to do in, feature, in the future, well, I'm going to expand what I'm doing. I'm going to start running all the samples in virtual machines and get the behavioral data of it. That way I can look at the command and control data, the fingerprint platforms, because if, as I said in the beginning, the uh, command and control protocol seldom change, or usually don't until it gets broken because <laughs> By changing it, you're losing your botnets. You're already losing your pre-compromised machines. So that was a very big, big uh, as, a, as a good fingerprint because even if you don't have the exact sample, the way they communicate is a is a giveaway. Also, looking going to look at the memory, the always changes, uh, and the behavior. What are what are they trying to do once you get the, on the machine? Uh, how does it keep the, how does it keeps itself on the machine? How does it do in the persistence? Does it do a DLL injection to other processes or just staying in its own process? All that I'm going to put back into the database and start do data mining. And I'm doing like fishing expeditions. I'm not really know what I'm looking for, but as soon as it's like uh, I wonder how how common is this setting or, or this piece of code or this flow of behavior calls, the API calls in this, in this particular order. How is common is that? I can do the look for it. So uh, I need to do more automation. Um, currently my code has uh, a memory issue. It, it hangs, it doesn't free the buffers every so often. I have temporarily solved it by it killing itself, and then have a script that automatically restarts it. <laughs> um, uh, I, there's a memory issue that uh, I'm not freeing my objects after I'm done, and to hunt it down. I need to back, go back and do a more modular design. Um, as I said, um, uh, the adding a sample takes way too much time. I mean, I want all the metadata, but I don't need it right away. It's more important than getting the data into the database and then another process can do asynchronous updates to the database for the PE header information and so on. I don't need it straight away. I have a, like, I'm getting a big data uh, issue. Um, so I'm having a, a seven terabytes of disk space at home and I have about half a terabyte free. Uh, I need to <laughs> I need to so, sort out my my disk space issue, and I need to sort out how I actually going to do the, the compare because getting the data is getting slower and slower and slower. The, the nice thing about having a big database is it's big, and even with indexes, they are slow, especially if you're doing advanced queries. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this uh, Hadoop uh, thing and see if I can use that one to to split out the load and making the prob uh, a large, complicated problem to smaller, easier to solve problems. I also want to automate the, the pretty graphs. Uh, the, the graph you were seeing that, that took about three hours yesterday to render. Um, the GraphVis um, library is good, but sometimes it's trying a little bit too hard to make pretty graphs and it fails. I need to have a find an, another graphing library. Uh, I saw some Google talk about the new one that uh, looks just like I want it. I haven't uh, investigated any more time in how to use it. But basically, I want to have more graphs, I want to have it automated, and I want to have them pretty. So, thank you. 
the code will be available as soon as I have an internet connection. I can do a, a git push up to GitHub. So I'm having committed everything, it's just going to a push. Um, the code is uh, under some open source license, which probably is GPL. Uh, I'm just using the same uh, license that the original was using. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I have some questions, but maybe there are questions from the audience um, before I as a. Uh, yes, a couple questions. Um, you said you're doing lookups on virus total. Yeah. Do you also uh, submit any of the samples you're analyzing to virus total, or is it no? Just no, right now I'm just lookups? getting the cached reports. Okay, the latest, the latest. Yeah. Change at the time. Uh, and and uh, I have a problem with doing so much uh, ending of samples that. Uh, I'm, I'm, with the public API key, you can only do four requests a minute. Yes. And I'm doing a lot of requests, so I have uh, built a small proxy mm -hmm. that is caching uh, the results mm -hmm. and it is also doing some funky stuff with the keys, so uh, I'm getting more. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, you mentioned that you, you're going to analyze uh, the binaries in a sandbox in the future. Yeah. Uh, what sandbox are you going to use for that? It depends if my employer sponsors me or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, if if it's, it's continued to be a, a, a hobby project, I will use the Cuckoo sandbox. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I get permission with, uh, from my employer, I will use our MAS uh, or uh, AX system is called now, uh, which is tons much cooler. So, <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Thanks. More questions? Um, for, the, for your future work regarding uh, behavioral analysis of the malware samples on your VMs, uh, do you have any ideas of how you're going to start looking at that? I mean, it seems to be quite a hard problem doing uh, binary analysis on already compiled malwares within, running on a VM. So I'm also looking at this kind of work by trying to study machine states and things, but it's, it's really challenging. And I just wondered if you had any ideas on techniques that you yeah, would use. Yeah, actually, I was thinking about uh, compiling the, the API calls into some kind of pseudo uh, co um, code. I just shrink it down to, to uh, just a few bytes and run SSDeep on it. As, because SSDeep is very good at finding matching patterns. So I don't need to compile, I don't need to look at each and every call and compare them. I just say I have a, a, a summarized version here and here and how much are they similar. So, so, so uh, the, the thing is with uh, compile code is that the, the, the assembly code can look a lot of different to do, perform the same thing, but you need to do, make those API calls either by name or by ordinal. And just look for that. Does those API calls comes up in the right kind of uh, pattern? Um, further questions? Then I insert my own, maybe that spawns some further discussions. Um, did you analyze popular malware that is well known, like a, say, Stuxnet or something? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um, uh, I, I might have. I haven't looked at specific samples. I just um, grabbed like a random sample and was like, mm, okay, how does this phone look? Okay. So, so I haven't got back and like, uh, how does the flame look like in regards to everything else and so on. Okay. Uh, and the related question is, uh, there are companies known to have to now have a product out there who previously have written malware like. A, Skype, they did some uh, uh, malware stuff before they did Skype. And all the techniques they are using, like Pekka and everything, is all also very malware-like. Have you tried analyzing existing non-malware software and comparing that stuff to, to malware you have found? Uh, I actually have some uh, ham in, in, the, in the code. I have like added uh, Windows binaries and, and Sys internals and so on to see that, but I haven't 
looked much into that, how much, uh, how much uh, code that uh, sys internals have provided to malware authors in, like, this is how we do it, and they co just copy it. I haven't looked into that yet. It's uh, something I, w I want to look at. I want to have a, a pretty graph where I can color code uh, samples which has been high, uh, high hit rate on virus total, low hit rate on virus total, and known good and unknowns. So I, I can see a colored gra graph okay. uh, how they are compared to each other. Especially correlations would be interesting because yeah. it could be that uh, some malware author is also yeah. Uh, during his day work uh, using some C, uh, compiler suite yeah. or something that then turns up in yeah. mal malware samples. So that would be interesting. You, you should expect they would be knowledgeable enough, but you, know, you never know. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah. my, my, my experience is that they are, they are like every other coders, they are lazy. Uh, I mean, it's very simple to clear out a lot of the uh, P had their version information, but they don't do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, they're lazy. They're not, uh, not enough people have been caught yet using this information. Yeah. So, so if you if you catch somebody, uh, maybe that gives you a further chance to explore that <laughs> as a day job because I, I find it very interesting. Yeah, but you still have problems with the code patterns. It's it's not easy to change your coding style yeah. between each sample. You, you have your favorite buffer size, it's 256 or 255 or 124, it's like, you want to, if you say, I want to have a buffer for a string, yeah, how, how, how many bytes do you reserve for that one? How does your structure, uh, variable structures look like? Yeah. Questions from the audience, any more? Over there, or no? Um. Uh, are you keeping the samples or? Uh, yeah, I'm keeping the samples. So these uh, terabytes you have are? Oh, uh, samples. <laughs> samples. So okay. Sorry. Mostly because the database itself is not that big. Uh, no, the, the, the metadata is not so big, but the, all, all the binaries are also yeah. being kept in, in the, the uh, grid FS inside MongoDB. And I also have the samples stored on this before I added them up. Okay. So when I download the sample from the internet, I still have to temporarily store them on disk before I'm adding them to okay. the database. So, so maybe one uh, idea would be to, to, uh, to only keep the extracted metadata and only when you want to go back to the samples to extract further features, uh, that you put that on a big tape like an LTO. You can store three, gig, three terabytes on, on a current version and it's not yeah. that expensive, maybe just a suggestion. Yeah. Okay. One more question. Um, the, the CNC, like domains and IPs, yeah. that would be something that you typically discover during dynamic analysis. Um, have you done any string searching to see if you discover any IP address or domain hard-coded in the samples? Would that be yeah, something that you uh, might maybe no, looking I, I, for? I, okay, yeah, I haven't uh, done uh, string extraction yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm looking for, it's, it's not difficult to do, it's just how am I going to store the data in the database in such a way I can easily look it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, because I not only want to find a string, I should I would like to be able to find where that string is. So if I let it, uh, extract the binary from the database, I would like to be able to go straight to that address and see where it is. But uh, the routine I have for string extraction does single out IPs and domain names, HTTP protocol and so on. Yeah, do we have further questions? Yeah, then thanks a lot. I think you are around if there are further questions and I find it very interesting and also that you publish the code. I think this is very val valuable for others to look into. And Yeah, if, if uh, Greg had uh, published his code, I probably wouldn't be doing this project. I would just be me using his code, but um, I, I find it useful for the code sharing is if someone wants to 
continue or uh, uh, contribute patches, I would be grateful. Uh, and if you want to have a copy of my malware database, we have to find some ways to make sure that my home internet is not clogged by doing so. But I'm sure we could find some if you're working for uh, education institution, maybe you, you could mirror my data and from there you can mirror out to other people. I, 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 don't, I don't claim any like copyright of the, of the data. It's, the ones who have the copyright is the malware authors uh, and I don't think they will stand up and say, hey, you copied my code. <laughs> okay, good luck. Maybe you find a solution how you can turn this hobby into daytime. Yeah, I hope to get, come back uh, next year and uh, present some more results, maybe even a, a Facebook uh, picture of some of the authors. Hopefully, you never know. Great, thanks. Thanks.